Hey, sorry for this big delay, but guess what? It's raining heavily in Jerusalem for the last, I don't know, supposed to keep out the 24 shadows. hours. Mm -hmm. That's great, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's what everybody says. So I know you're all praying for rain, aren't you? Everyone in, around the world, you're not praying for rain for Israel? Karen, you know Israel needs the rain. We have um, special prayers that we've been involved with for a long time now. What I'd like to do, and I'm not sure I gave you the right sheets. I, I, uh, I think I, I did. So it's law number two in the Shochan Aruch. Karen, I'm really apologizing. I didn't give you the, the translation. We do, we have been using the translation as well. I'm sure, you know, next time I'll send it to you. Um, Which part? Huh? Which part? Because I might have it in my... No, I gave you the Hebrew. Uh, so if you have Hebrew, it looks like this. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't send you the translation. So what I'll do, next time I'll send you the link. It's a link on a... On a okay. Uh, it might be familiar anyways, but thank you. Right, right. So I, I sent you the links from the previous classes on the Shochan Aruch, on the Halacha series. Uh-huh. That was two parts just to discuss that first paragraph. So now we're going to talk about paragraph two and probably three in Mitzvah Hashem today. Maybe even four. We'll see how far we get. Yeah, I did give you, um, it will call it Bet, Gimel, and Dalit. So Bet says, Hamashkim Litchanein Lifnei. You know what? Let me just start over. I just want to say hi, everybody. Welcome, because we're also on camera besides all the people here, a live audience and on Skype. So we're going to continue the Halakha series, and we're on paragraph 2 in the first um, chapter. Hamashkim l'hitchanein l'ifnei bayroi. So once you get up very early, we're going to talk about how early, perhaps even in the middle of the night, uh, in order to beckon, here he says, supplicate before our Creator, Yechavein l'sha'ot mishtanot ha-mishmeret, ha-mishmerot. So, believe it or not, these heavenly watches that we're talking about are the times that the angels themselves change, how would you say, change, change, change the guard. There's a, a guard change in heaven. I'll tell you, I'll tell you something I, I mentioned last night in the class. The real world, the world that really exists is the spiritual world. This world is only an illusion. And like when we say God created the world, something from nothing, right? Yesh miyayin, something from nothing. Or in Latin, it's the only Latin That's word the, I know, ex nihilo. He created the world, something from nothing, right? There was, it's not true. It is true and it's not true. What we mean is that God created the physical world from the spiritual world. The spiritual world is the real world, and this world is a, an illusion. And we're going to talk about it later on in the Parsha series, because there was no water. It says they complained there was no water, and we're going to find that they were not studying Scripture. They, they were in the desert, and they were lacking Torah. They were weak in Torah, and therefore there was no water, because the Torah is compared to water. Okay, So... The water didn't exist because of the spiritual aspect that we were lacking in Torah. We were lacking in the spiritual. Therefore, there was a physical manifestation of, hey, Chris. Welcome. Um, so basically, when we get up, we should get up in the middle of the night, or we'll talk about the time, and, and we should um, target, we should try to pinpoint the time that of the changing of the heavenly guards in Shehain Bishlish Halila. Okay, so how does he translate it? It's one third of the night. Lesof Shne Shlish Halila. So there's three guards at the two different changes in the middle. And at the end, the Lesof. What 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 what's the prayers that we should be praying at that time? We should be praying. Can you imagine? This is what we're praying about. Al hachorban v'al hagalut haritzuya. That we should be davening for the. We should be praying for the over the destruction of the temple, and on the exile, that it should be finished. That it should be rebuilt. The temple should be rebuilt, and that the exile should be complete. 
and we should be returned. Can you imagine? This is, this is the Shokhanach, the second law. This is what we should be doing. One day, this law will be abolished. Can you imagine saying such a thing? That a law should be abolished? Um, let's see, in the mission of Ruhr, does he mention anything? Um, not on the first page. Interestingly enough, I'll turn the page. Not at all. Okay, so the Mishnah Bird does not mention anything. Okay, so the next halacha. I told you I was going to go through with it, you know, a little bit quicker. Roy Lakol Yure Shemayim. It's fitting for anybody who has a proper and healthy awe of God. Shiyem Metzer Vidoig Chorban Beit Mikdash that they should be pained and worried about the fact that we have no temple. Okay? As he translated, exactly as I said. And do I want to do this piece? Give him, yeah, Roy. Hmm? Roy Lacole. Roy Lacole. Let me just see what he says here. Yeah, okay. So I don't know how much of it we'll read. He says, uh, Hakubalim ha'arichu ma'od begoido milas kayamas chatzos ki rabahi. The mystics, the mystics, they go at length, at great length, to talk about how great a virtue it is to get up in the middle of the night and um, and do this and pray about the destruction of the temple. And he mentions that there are many of our sidurim, our prayer books, have the prayers. And I think that we will end up skipping most of this. Is that right? You know what? I'll start reading it, and I'll decide when. Kvar nitpas b'sidurim seder hanhaga al pi kisve arizal. According to the arizal, there's many writings that are you'll find in the sidur. Uh, organized prayers. Ala churban nachon yoter shiyekodem chatzot smaat. To, I, I did skip something. I skipped the whole line. Uzman chatzosu tamid be'emtsu'ut halayla mamash b'kol makom. So there's going to be a different, uh, there's going to be a, okay, I'm going to introduce the word, a maklokis. A maklokis means an argu argument amongst the rabbis, exactly when midnight is. Some say it's going to be the same time every night, no matter where you are. So that would be according to the clocks that we use today. And some will use what we call um, Jewish time. We split up the night into 12 equal hours, like we split up the day into 12 equal hours, which means during the winter, those 12 hours at night will be longer than 60 minutes, and during the day in the summer, they will be longer than 60 minutes, and vice versa, the opposite in the, in the winter, okay? Because we have shorter nights in the summer. And it's always 12 hours, Okay, that's according to the first opinion. So he says, that the, the time to really supplicate about the destruction of the temple, it's most proper, just a little bit before midnight. And then from midnight onwards, this is the time to involve yourself in learning Torah. This is what David Hamela, King David, he got up in the middle of the night. How did he get up? There was a harp above his bed, and the window was open, and a northern wind, which Hashem produced, always made music on his harp, and he was able to get up, although the question is, he actually was already up, uh, just to know exactly when midnight was. Ubisof um, Halayla, at the end of the night, you should seek, you know, request from Hashem your needs. Um, and we talked about this idea of saying, I know that Mayor asked me, was it, is it okay for a non-Jew to say, the answer is yes. I think that was your question. Or, Mayor, are you still there? No, we lost him. Okay. Camera is not working, but that's fine. Okay, so what were you um, asking me about? Someone who you. had a hard time sleeping? Whether or not they should say it? Is that what you asked me? No. I'm 
in the morning when I get up, it's usually, uh, it's usually I, I wake up early in the morning and then I fall asleep again. So there are mornings that I'm not sure that I'm going to fall asleep. So what, okay, so I say modeani no matter what, and then when I wake up again, sometimes it's an hour, sometimes an hour and a half, to make sure I, I say another modeani. Okay, you don't need to say it twice, as far as I know, but the first time, if you're intending to go right back to sleep, you, I don't think you need to say it. When, if you're going to get up, and you know you're going to be up for a while, and you, you had a good night's sleep, let's say you had four hours, six hours, that's enough for you, you should say modani, thinking you're going to be up. Maybe you'll be up for an hour or two. It's perfectly fine to say modani then. Now, there's nothing wrong with really saying it twice, because the God's name is not mentioned in it. So it's certainly not a bracha levatala. It's not a useless uh, concept. To be in, 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 in your whole being so grateful that God returned your soul, you, we'd be saying modani all day long. I mean, there's really nothing wrong with it. Do you say anything wrong? No. So, um, but I think that if you tend to go immediately back to sleep, you're just having a hard time. I wouldn't really say modani at the time. But if you're going to get up for like a, a time and learn Torah... If you had a good night's sleep already, then uh, it's perfectly legitimate uh, to say it. Now, the modani, maybe I'll send Karen, and um, it's a, it's a, um, sta a, a it's not a really a blessing, but a statement of gratitude that Hashem has returned our soul, and that we talked about in uh, in uh, part one or two. So I'll send you the uh, I'll send you the printout. In fact, Kathy made beautiful notes, so maybe she'll send them to you. Um, Kathy, if you could do that, I'll send you uh, Karen's uh, email address, that's okay. Sure, sure, I'd like to do that. Okay. That would be great. She wrote beautiful notes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Rabbi Aaron. Yeah. Rabbi Aaron. For Kathy, she has to say Moda'an. Correct. Um, for a woman, correct, it's a, uh, you use the feminine. I am grateful. Moda. Okay. Um, I think we're going to skip down to Yudav. Chorben Beit HaMikdash. Is that right? Now, interestingly enough, he mentions that every time that we eat, okay, it's in Yud Aleph, Chorben Beit HaMikdash, even though, oh, maybe the one before that, Shiyeh Matzer, a very important one. Even though in the middle of the night we get up and we're in pain and we're worried about the fact that we have no temple, as it was mentioned, that's what we do. We pray then with a lot of um, a feeling of anguish. But then it says then, then to learn Torah. When you learn Torah, you have to be besimcha. This is the word of God that is entering our hearts and our minds and our soul and our, our whole being. And uh, I'm not going to say it's usher, because if you're depressed, you should still learn Torah, right? There's no isser, there's no forbiddenness. Um, I think it is forbidden to be depressed. So if you are depressed, get out of it. Um, so he says, right, that when it says you should do this within a state of sadness, but, that, but when it comes to Torah, learning scripture, and prayer... You should be in a state of joy. So um, we can talk, we can make a whole class about how we can a a achieve that state. But you understand how important that is? Now, when we talked about the Chorben Beit HaMikdash, the fact that we're praying over the, the destruction, the fact that it's destroyed, the Shlach Kaddish writes that every time we have a meal, during, you know, meal with bread, that we washed our hands and ate bread with, so before we do the Birkat Hamazon, before we do the grace after meals, any other way to translate that? Like grace after meals? It's okay. Blessing after meals. Blessing after meals. Blessing we, after we say the Tehillim or Al Naharos Bavel, and that is uh, regarding the destruction and the exile um, of the Jewish people going into Babylon, in order to remember, even though we're in a state of Simcha when we bench, even like at weddings, Jewish weddings, we break a cup, we put ashes on the forehead of, it's probably where Ash Wednesday might have come from, I don't know, that's a Christian thing. 
But uh, over the destruction of the temple, we put um, ashes on the bridegroom. That's what the man is called, the bridegroom? The groom, let's just call him the groom. The groom, I don't know why they call him the bridegroom, but maybe you guys know. Um, we put ashes, there's a, a many things. When we build a home, there's a thing called Zecher Lechorben. It's a little piece, like a, one ama. An ama is a, uh, huh? a cubit by a cubit, um, left unpainted across from the doorway when you walk in to remember that we're not complete. There's something missing. We're missing the Mashiach. We're missing the time where the base of Mikdash will be rebuilt and the exiles will be brought in. Uh, not exactly in that order, but it doesn't matter. The point is that we know that there's something lacking. So during the weekday when we bench, when we bench, that's uh, the blessing after the meals, we do that, that psalm. But on Shabbos and also on Yomim Tovim, we say the other one is called Shir Hamalos, and that is we were like dreamers and we're in such a happy state when we will return. Um, the main thing is Ve'ikar Shiyeda Masha Ka'amar. The main thing is all, all of the Tachanunim, all of the prayers, whatever we're doing, it's important we understand exactly what we're saying, and we have special intent in the heart from the words that we express. So if you have to start and say these things in English, or uh, even as just beginning, if you want to start with just one paragraph and then really you know, get to know it well, and then start with the second paragraph and do it in stages so uh, you're not overwhelmed. But the main point is to have intent, to understand what you're saying, which goes along with the next interesting halacha, it says, Tov, this is Dalit now, number four, Tov ma'atachanunim bekavana meharve below kavana. Since there really are many, many, many prayers in Judaism, we walk around with books, right? We're praying all the time. Some of these prayers are what we call obligatory, right? Whether it's the Shema or the Shema Esrei. But some of them, and of course, uh, benching after the meals, many of them are regarding the destruction of the temple and to bring the Jewish people back home and we're crying and we're wailing and I guess that's why they called it the wailing wall but it's the western wall um, it says this is a very important halakha that it's better to minimize and say less with meaning than say a whole lot without any feeling or meaning to it so once we know what the priorities right we already said right the Shema and the Amida, the silent um, prayer, those are like, you know, we'll call one is from the Torah, the other one is from the rabbis, it's mandatory. And the rest is also mandatory, but it's, let's just put it to the side and say that it's better to say less with more meaning. You can actually diminish these. You don't, can't diminish the Shema or the Shema Nesre, but you can diminish these, min, diminish meaning say less, and have more intent than, God forbid, trying to just uh, mimic. mimic, be a robot, and just to be Yossi Zayn, just to say it. So that's it. That's it for today for the Shulchan Aruch. I think.